Welcome to the Code of Catch Up podcast. My name is Jamie Jones. In this episode, I'm quite excited because I'm going to be talking about Rails 5.1, which was just released. Uh, and this was by DHH. I'm going to be going through the blog post article. Now, it is a, it's not a huge release, but it certainly is a release that has a fair bit of impact. So, basically, going to be running through this blog uh, top to bottom and just giving some of my thoughts. Uh, as well as just generally the information here. So TLDR, basically JavaScript uh, inclusion with Webpack, uh, system tests, encrypted secrets, and really what I find probably important out of this as well is the emerging of form tag and form four, which is really necessary. So if that's all you really want to listen to, that's kind of the key line articles. I've got a link to the rest of the blog post in the show notes, and you can go check that out. But if you want to get more of a rundown, keep listening because here we go. So loving JavaScript, we've had a stormy, perhaps even contentious relationship with JavaScript over the years, but that time is past. JavaScript has improved immensely over the past few years, particularly with the advent of ES6, or as we know, ES 2015, etc., and with package and compilation tools like Yarn and Webpack. Rails is embracing, embracing both of these solutions with open arms and letting whatever pass water flow under the bridge. JavaScript and Ruby share a deep philosophical bond over language design, if not ecosystem management. Let's focus on the aspects we have in common and help Rails programmers extract the best from JavaScript with the help of some key guiding conventions. So there's three major uh, points or parts of this release that really have a pretty big impact. And that first one is manage JavaScript dependencies from NPM via Yarn. So if you're not too sure what Yarn is, it's basically like Bundler for JavaScript, and it takes uh, the package JSON and just a bit further, which is awesome. Uh, and that, that makes it really easy to depend on libraries such as React, Vue, etc. Uh, and, and it's just a, a nice inclusion, and it's good to see that they're using these tools that everyone is going to by default. Option two, or point two, optionally compile JavaScript with Webpack. Now, they're saying here, while there are a million different module bundlers compilers for JavaScript, Webpack is quickly emerging as the preeminent choice. We've made it easy to use uh, to use Webpack with Rails through the new Webpacker gem. They can configure automatically on new projects with TacTac Webpack or Dash Dash Webpack. Now, Chris from Go Rails, I think it's Chris from Go Rails. Basically, check out Go Rails. There's a, a video on Webpacker uh, and the Webpacker gem, and it's really really good. So, highly recommend checking that one out if you want to get more in depth. Now, you might be thinking, that's great, but I want to get started with React or Angular or Vue on my project. There's actually built-in configuration or tailored configuration for this. So when you do your TacTac Webpack, you do equals React if you want to do React, and it'll give you uh, a Webpack configuration that's tailored for React. Same thing with Angular or Vue. Uh, I don't know if anything else will come later on down the line for Aurelia or anything like that. not too sure. Uh, but this is definitely it's putting things out there for that ability to happen in the future. So next point, point three, drop, drop jQuery as a default dependency. Uh, we used to require jQuery in order to provide features like data remote, data confirm, uh, and other parts of Rails UJS. This dependency is no longer necessary as we've rewritten Rails UJS to use vanilla JavaScript. You're of course still free to use jQuery, but you no longer have to. Now, a lot of the time, at least lately in projects, I've had jQuery in there just for UJS, and that's a pretty big dependency for something that I was only using a little bit of. So being able to take that out and not have to worry about it anymore is fantastic. Of course, if I wanted, I can bring it back in. The main thing was because a lot of people are now writing vanilla JavaScript thanks to things like ES6 or ES2015, 2016, etc., it, there's just really no need. A lot of the stuff that jQuery is being used for was simple stuff that can be done very easily in vanilla JavaScript now, so it's good to see it's gone. So the next up, which I'm going to read verbose uh, here, is system tests. In my 2014 keynote at RailsConf, I spoke at length about how an overfocus on unit tests and TDD has led us astray. While unit tests are part of a complete testing solution, they're not the most important one. Integration tests that verify behavior all the way from controllers through models and views should play a much bigger part. Rails already has a great answer for these baked in. But integration tests do not help you test the entire system. If that system relies on JavaScript and most major web systems today rely at least on, to some extent on JavaScript, that's where system tests driven by a real browser come in. There's long been an answer for system tests like this in Ruby called Capybara. 
it's just been a kind of a journey to configure them properly for Rails. And this is very true. The rest of this portion of the article rings so true, and it's oh, oh, I love that this is in here. So continuing on. Now we've baked them straight into the framework. You get a lovely wrapping of Capybara that's pre-configured for Chrome and enhanced to provide failure screenshots as part of Action Dispatch. You also don't have to worry about extra database cleanup strategies anymore because the baked-in transactional tests now roll back system test changes. So this is awesome where you'd normally go and set up uh, database cleaner and, and Capybara screenshot, stuff like that. You don't really have to using these system tests, which is fantastic. You just don't have to worry about it. It's less configuration that you have to fiddle around with to get right. Uh, these tests are not without trade-offs. It's, of course, still slower to run through a whole browser setup than just test a model with a stubbed-out database, but it also tests so much more. You do well to familiarize yourself with system tests and have them as part of your testing answer. Uh, at the end of this, it's thanks to Eileen. I don't want to say your last name because I'll probably butcher it. Uh, but it says thanks to Eileen for her work extracting this from Basecamp. So hats off, Eileen. That's an awesome, amazing effort. Next up is encrypted secrets. And this one, this one I really love as well. Uh, basically, I'm going to read, read some of this here. Uh, if you want a TLDR, basically, you're getting a secrets file that's encrypted that you can uh, include in version control, whereas you shouldn't have been in the past. So if you're checking production passwords, API keys, and other secrets undisguised into your version control system, you're doing it wrong. That's not safe, and you should stop it, and you really should. Like, that's a massive no-no. Uh, that's an, Now, that's an easy prescription, but without a coherent answer to what you should do instead, it's also not that helpful. People have long been loading up the environment, or sort of env, to store these secrets or used a variety of other solutions. There are all sorts of trade-offs and drawbacks to the env model. Uh, just my own personal notes here, that is though kind of like uh, across the board with frameworks. Env is very, very common uh, solution and there are some trade-offs with getting that right. Uh, and I think uh, encrypted secrets does solve that, but you still need env possibly. So not least of which you still need to store those secrets for real somewhere else, which is one of the, the big things. Uh, so inspired by Ara, hopefully I'm pronouncing that, Ara T. Howard's secrets gem. So that's with secrets with a K instead of a C. We've built encrypted secrets management into Rails 5.1. You can set up a new encrypted secrets file with bin slash Rails secrets colon setup, and that'll generate a master key you'll store outside of the repository really important, outside of the repository, but allow you, you to commit the actual production secrets to your revision control. They're then decrypted in production either through an injected key file or through rails underscore master underscore key in the end. So you'd have you'd like export rails underscore master on the key or however you want to load up your environment variables and you'd install it there or you can inject that key file. It's really up to you and how you want to approach that. As a thank you to Casper Tim Hansen, for the work on this and Ara for the inspiration. So hats off to everyone who's worked on that. This is definitely something that's going to make a big impact in security and just keeping things all around well organized in Rails. Next up is parameterized mailers. And I'm just going to skip over this one a little bit because uh, it is a bit lengthy. Uh, but basically, in, in your action controllers, you could use before actions or similar kind of callbacks uh, to basically ex extra logic that applies across multiple actions within your controllers. And that's great because you had access to the params hash before any actions were invoked. So that was the main thing and why you could do that. And you couldn't do that in an action mailer. So all you could do was basically regular uh, method signatures and very explicit arguments. So all those extra things that you could run before it just wasn't available. So with parameterized mailers, you now have the option of, of calling mailers with parameters that, like in controllers, are available before the actions are invoked. So this is basically going to dry up things. So think of combining like your default to from reply to headers, and that's just going to dry up your mailers quite a lot, which is awesome. Uh, and it's also completely backwards compatible, and you can just convert the mailers, um, but that basically going to stand to gain the most from that extract. And, and, and yeah, it's just so much nicer. Your mailers is going to become a lot neater. Uh, next up is direct and resolved routes. So we have a lovely simple API for declaring new resource routes. But if you'd like to add new programmatic routes that has logic determining the final destination based on the parameters, well, you'd have to throw your own boat basically with your own helpers and stuff like that. 
So with directed routes, you can now declare programmatic routes that have the full power of Ruby to do different things depending on the parameters passed. Uh, there's an example here, you have to check it out, but it definitely makes things a lot easier. Uh, and to finish things off, uh, unifying form tag and form for with form with. Now, I'm just going to read this quickly off here, but this is oh, this has so, been needed for so long. Uh, so we've long had to, had two parallel structures for creating forms. Those that were based off records through form four, so you think of your models and things like that, where we use convention over configuration to extract the details and manually configure ones using form tag. Now we've unified these two hierarchies with form with a single root tree that you can configure through an inferred record, so using like an active record object, or manually. And it's much nicer and simpler, uh, thanks to Casper Tim Hansen for this one. Um, this is brilliant and something I wish they'd done a lot earlier, but it's here now, which is great. So it's really going to just fix up a lot of uh, annoying forms where I've had to switch to form tags. So that's great to see. Now, of course, there's a, an exhaustive list of changes. Uh, there's links in the show notes to those. Of course, the, the same main maintenance policy applies uh, for security release and stuff, it's all it's all going to be changing, so expect that to all be bumped up. Now, if you are upgrading to Rails 5.1, if you've got tests, then you're going to have a pretty good time at this. Otherwise, you might have to do a bit of manual checking. Now, I do recommend using railsdiff.org uh, to make sure that you do the upgrade correctly because there's more than likely going to be files that have also changed. It's not just going to be a gem uh, version number to change or anything like that. So... I don't know when that will be updated. Maybe by the time this episode is out, it will be updated. But basically, go go use Rails Diff to put in your previous version or the current version of Rails that you're on and the Rails version you want to go to, 5.1, and it will give you a diff of what uh, gems have changed, uh, what you need to include, what you need to remove uh, across all the different files and stuff like that, and it'll make it a lot easier. Now, of course, if you're on uh, like Rails 4 or something like that, I still recommend doing the staged updates going to the major point releases. So if you're on 4 going up that way, um, as opposed to jumping straight from 4 to 5.1, you'll just have a lot better time. So just iterate towards that. Uh, there's going to be minor point releases anyway. Uh, after this is now out and being tested in the wild. So anyway, that's all my recommendations. I'd love to know what your thoughts are on this release. You know, what, what are you most excited about? Send through a tweet to at CodaCatchup on Twitter. Send through an email to CodaCatchup at gmail.com or leave a comment on CodaCatchup.com for this episode. If you do have a spare few moments, I'd really appreciate a rating and review in iTunes. That would be awesome. Also, if you haven't checked out the YouTube channel, please do check it out and subscribe. That would be even better. Uh, but other than that, we'll catch the next episode.